Episode two, so if you want to catch up, it's free on Amazon Prime and Netflix, right? Peacock. Peacock, sorry. Oh, we also have the DVD in one bar. And we have the DVD in one bar to catch up. Um, it's a series about Jesus, so it's really good. Uh, six through twelfth graders, the encounter's coming up in two weeks, so uh, the 25th. Um, make sure your money is in, like, hopefully way before the 25th, but if not, next Sunday. Next Sunday. Yeah, so... That would be great. And if you don't have a willing, uh, we have people who are willing to talk pay if you don't have the means. So uh, just let us know. Actually, let Katie know too. Um, board meeting next week, not net week. Net week. It's net week. Uh, and uh, if, um, yep, that's about it. Any other announcements? I know that was like hitting a wall right there with me. All right, if not, let's go and uh, read scripture together. I'll start reading, and then when the dots are, everybody reads together. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. The man will be He will lead them to springs of living water. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Are there any prayer requests? Uh, yes, especially uh, Ukraine and Russia. Shelly, uh, Shelly yep. Shelly's on some new medicine and, and just she's hurting right now, so pray for her. JT Tolly and the whole Tolly family, yes. And Ellie. Also pray for Katie, her foot. Um, I think we, she pulled a tendon. Uh, just pray for her healing. Also pray for uh, Cheryl. Uh, her mom had a stroke last night and um, is not doing so well. Uh, Steve and Susie Marr. Um, it's a friend, uh, a friend in, at school. Um, he needed uh, to ask for prayer for him. Um, just all the medical needs, especially COVID and things like that. Help us to have a revival in the land. Help us to have 100 people by end of 2022. And um, uh, February 27th, I'll, I'll be gone with Katie to the Managna. Um, I really need a lot of prayer to help find people to, to lead. Um, all it is is really praying and talking. I just need somebody up here. Um, and so I uh, just pray that God will find the right person. Um, and to go smoothly that Sunday. I'm always nervous when I leave. So uh, just help me to relax also. Uh, those who don't know Jesus and definitely our government and, and school. And voting coming up shortly too, so pray for all that. Uh, for God's wisdom to be with us. Anything else? Uh, 
Um, we should start praying for the teams we're going to. Yes, pray for the teams going. It's a four hour trip, so pray for us there too. <laughs> and some teams are driving with us, so pray for us there too. <laughs> Anything else? All right, if not, let's go to God in prayer. God, we are so thankful to be here together, and thank you so much for letting us uh, use technology also. And uh, I pray for those who are uh, on Facebook and those who are here, that um, all of them will be answered according to your will, not ours. We thank you that we could um, encourage one another and equip each other for service and for uh, life itself. God, we know we're in a spiritual battle, and I uh, just pray that we will... Uh, know that the armor of God is, is right there for us, that we can uh, read our, our Bible, and that we can spiritually be prepared for anything. God, we thank you that you are loving and merciful, and that we can repent if we ever feel like we're going away or we've done something uh, against you. Uh, God, I pray that we will rem- repent and come back to you. God, I pray for a revival in the land, that our hearts will change, and that this country will come back to you. And uh, God, nothing is beyond saving because you have uh, have given away through Jesus Christ. God, I pray for the military and the government, and uh, we pray for peace in Russia and Ukraine. And I pray for the government to make wise choices and help the military to be protected also. God, I pray for Cheryl and her mom and uh, things that are going on there. Uh, she's uh, very upset, but uh, God, your will will be done. I pray for Steve and Susie Marr and the things, the medical things that they're going through. I pray for JT and the whole Holly family, and especially JT with his back. And God, I pray for uh, Ellie with uh, the health issues that she has right now. And uh, strengthen uh, Sarah and uh, to help her to uh, help her, her family. God, I pray for Katie's foot and that you may heal and that you may get her back uh, uh, from this uh, this time. God, I pray for Shelly and, and that the doctors will help her and the medication. God, we thank you for the teams that are going to Menegnock and the traveling mercies that you'll provide. And I I, I just pray that you will um, stir the hearts of the teams now as you are preparing them for um, listening to the Word of God and having fun and and, uh, knowing that they can come to us about anything. Uh, There's no sin uh, too um, horrible that you won't forgive and that that we can work on and, and come back to you. Uh, God, I pray that we will be revived also, Katie and I, as we see these teams uh, and uh, see what's happening um, with uh, your, your kingdom in, in the Northeast Kingdom. And, uh, God, thank you so much for letting us go to this event, and I pray that you will help all the teams, not just ours, uh, but everyone that's there. I pray that we can have 100 people by the end of 2022, that you may uh, fill this place, because everyone needs to know Jesus. Um, it's not a a physical thing, but it's a spiritual thing uh, that we can have people hear the word, word of God and sing praises to you and have a revival in their hearts. God, we thank you for the medical field for helping us and, and uh, giving them knowledge and, and understanding, helping them have more wisdom uh, to to help through these crises. And uh, God, that they may acknowledge you as the author and perfecter of all knowledge, even medical things. God, thank you so much for your love and your mercy. I pray that you would be with us today as we come and sing to you and hear the word of God and hear the word of God and, and uh, come to give of our offering and, and communion that may stir our hearts to draw closer to you. We just love you and thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and we're going to sing. Oh, this time Kate will sit and I will sit.
fears and the things that are false and uh, God, we can pray that uh, we can just know that you are there for us no matter what we do. And uh, we can repent and come back to you. We just love you and thank you for being our Father and our Savior and our brother. And I pray that you always come to you. In Jesus' name, my friend. You may have a seat. So, uh, we've been talking about this idea of coming to the table, that um, we are having this table in front of our, our enemies, and that Jesus is the bread of life. Uh, Jesus uh, said that he's the bread of life, that he's the one that sustains our spiritual bodies, that he's the one we uh, spiritually need to eat from, and also that this is our food also. This is our spiritual food, which is the Bible, which we need to be in it and read it to actually get the food. You know, if you have a nice table of food and you don't actually eat it, it's not worth anything, right? So you have to have to pick up the Bible and read it to get our spiritual food. And so, 
you know, of course, when you have food, um, unless you're like Katie yesterday when I went to Subway and I forgot her drink, she was hacking up a lung because she ate this whole sub without something to drink. Okay, and so obviously when you're eating bread, uh, you need something to wash it down. And so God compares Jesus to living water. Okay, uh, so last week we talked about the bread of life. We're going to talk about the water. And so here's the water right up here. I, Katie said, uh, I mean, I said to Katie, I said, I'm going to put the water in the, in the cup. See, the water's in the cup. Yeah. Okay, so some cool things about water. Um, there is the same amount of water on earth as there was when the earth was formed. Think about that. Because the water cycle, it's always been here, it's even since Adam and Eve. So you might be drinking the same water that Adam and Eve drank in the garden. Nearly 97, 97% of the world's water is salty, which is undrinkable. Another 2% is locked in the ice caps and glaciers. That leaves 1% for all humanity needs. All the art, agriculture, residential, manufacturing, community, and personal needs. So we better take care of our water. Water regulates the earth's temperature. It also regulates the temperature of the human body. It carries nutrients and oxygen to cells, cushions joints, protects organs and tissues, and removes waste. If you're if you're hurting in your body, the best thing to do is what? Drink water. So no, you need two waters per coffee. Anyway, caffeine takes out the water. Um, so you need at least eight to ten glasses of water. I usually get like seventy-two ounces. I'm a freak with water, you know. There you go. Okay, I just love my water. Um, Seventy-five percent of the human brain is filled with water. Seventy-five percent of a living tree is water, also. So we all need water. A person can live about a month without food, but only how long for without water? One week, seven days. Then your organs start shutting down. Uh, the average total home water use in America is how many gallons per day? Do you think? Fifty gallons a day per person. So that's you know four times five. That's a lot of gallons in our house. The average cost for water supply to the home is about two dollars per one thousand gallons, which equals about five gallons for a penny. Just think if milk was that cheap. Anyway. Water expands by 9% when it freezes. Frozen water is lighter than water, which that's why ice floats. And water, the living water, is the most important thing to our spiritual lives. And so we're going to be talking about the living water. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to mess with your mind because <coughs> everybody thinks when you talk about water, you're talking about physical water, right? We're talking about spiritual water. So I'm going to go from physical to spiritual a lot. So hopefully you can keep up. It's okay if you can't. Then you can read this in the Bible when you get home and then you're like, oh yeah, this is it. But just try to keep up. So the living water sees opportunity. Now when I say the living water, guess who I'm talking about? Jesus. Okay? And so the living water sees opportunity. So Jesus here is going to see an opportunity and we need to see opportunity also. John 4, 1, 3. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisee had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was John, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. Yeah. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired, and he was from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noontime. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone in town to buy food. Now, some, there's some interesting background that you need to know. Typically, Pharisees and Sadducees and most of the Jews did not associate with Samaritans. They kind of hated them. Uh, they called them halfies. Uh, they were half Gentile, half Jew. They were kind of, they, mm, we're not going in that district, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we're not going to that street or that strip in town. Uh, when we were in Baltimore, uh, we lived kind of the outskirts of Baltimore, but um, you knew two uh, streets before you hit the harbor, you don't want to be there, okay? Typically all the drugs are there and all the other things, if you can just imagine. But guess where I wanted to go all the time? Right there, because that's where Jesus needs to be. But anyway, that's a whole different other story. Um, but Samaria was not typically the 
place that Jews would go. They would actually travel a whole day around the town. They wouldn't even go through. And so here's Jesus, obviously a Jew, um, going into Samaria. And then, not only that, his disciples went to buy some food at the Samaritan, you know, uh, place where they bought food, which is interesting because I wonder what the Jew, I wonder what the disciples were talking about. Dude, does he not know not to go through there? And so here is not only Jesus encountering a Samaritan, but a a woman. Okay, uh, which typically, if if it wasn't your husband or your friend or your family, you kind of usually didn't talk to them, especially the Samaritan. So we have to understand here's. Jesus seeking an opportunity with somebody who nobody really wanted to care about. And it's interesting also that the Pharisees and Sadducees were told in their law to be the light or be the example to these people. And yet they went around a whole day's worth to just skip them. I think that's why Jesus was so mad at the Pharisees and Sadducees, the leadership, the, the, the uh, religious leadership, because they were not leading spiritually. They were leading by law. They were leading by, well, we don't feel like doing this. Or they, or they interpret it however they want. And so instead of condemning this woman, that she was a Samaritan, and that, she shouldn't, that they shouldn't be talking, he sought an opportunity to realize love and understanding. Now it gets kind of complicated here because the woman is thinking of the physical well and water, and Jesus wants to bring the opportunity that he is the living water, that she doesn't have to thirst spiritually anymore. So she's kind of on this edge of, why are you here, why are you getting physical water, and you're talking about water. So we'll go on here. Jesus seizes the opportunity, and he talks about the worldview. Now, what is a worldview? Well, we'll talk about that after I read the scripture. John chapter 4, 9 through 12. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am the Samaritan woman. So even the Samaritan woman was like, Dude, you're a Jew. Why are you talking? How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. I love that they put that in there. Jesus answered her, I, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you, what? Living water. Of course, he's seeking an opportunity here to teach spiritually. And then she responds this way. I think, I think sometimes we just get caught up in our physical life that sometimes we don't get hit over the head by spiritual things. We just don't think about it. And I think that's maybe where she was coming from, that, yeah, she knew the spiritual stuff that the Jews believed, but she just, in the moment, you just get caught off guard. I'm not making excuses for her, but if Jesus really wanted a drink of water from our house and he came in our house, would we be thinking... What kind of water? Is it Dasani, uh, Nirvana, um, you know, uh, the pure water? What's that stuff called? Anyway. Life water. Yeah, life water. You know, what? Should you have it out of the tap? Oh, that has too much stuff in it. Well, it should have that. You know, we would be thinking, like, we, he wants the best water. And he's teaching what? I don't want water. I want you to have the living water. And so he's seeking this opportunity to. to, to bring her worldview into a spiritual idea. So verse 11, Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with. Again, she's thinking physical. And the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? You Are you greater than our father Jacob? Well, the answer to Jesus is, Yes, I'm the one who made the well. I'm the one who made the water. I'm the one who made Jacob. But anyway, Who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock. So to go all the way back in the Old Testament, and uh, Jacob drew from this well, um, this was supposed to be for the Jews, like the Samaritan, the whole Samaritan town or, or district was supposed to be to the Jews, but they mixed with Gentiles, and nobody liked them anymore. And so here's this uh, well that is supposed to be in the hands of the Jews, but now the Samaritan people have it. How can you ask me for a drink? I wonder what was going on through her mind. No man treats me like this. Maybe. Why are you so kind? Because we'll find out that she probably was thinking something like that. What is wrong with you that you would speak to me of every, anybody? Or I'm a strong Samaritan woman and you're a Jew. Who cares about you? What makes you special? But her worldview was looking at it through the lens of physical means. Now, a worldview is how you view everything 
uh, through your insight or your perspective. Okay? So my worldview is that God made you special, that he loves you, that you have purpose, and that you're not just a clump of cells, that you were made for a purpose in your mother's womb, um, you were one in a billion, and you need Jesus. That's my whole worldview. So everything that I do, if I'm doing a computer program, if I'm doing going to help somebody, if I'm encouraging somebody at school, I'm doing it for the fact that I want to bring them to Jesus. And so everything that, that I see usually is a spiritual thing. So I probably won't watch things that uh, would hurt me spiritually. I probably won't read things that hurt me spiritually. I probably won't listen to things that hurt me spiritually. So my focus, my worldview is everything that I, everything that's in your mind, you put on that view of your world. So some people call, you know, myself, rosy colored glasses. That I look at the world in a, in a good way. That, that goodness can triumph evil. That uh, people should have the benefit of the death. That uh, Jesus can save anybody, no matter what they've done. Other people worldview would say, well, the, the world is dark, and, and I'm going to do evil, and it makes me feel good. So I'm going to do what I want. So everything that they do comes from a selfish worldview. Or some people might say, my worldview is about money. So everything I do is going to be about money. Everything I think about, everything I, I do is going to be transferred to money. And so here's, here's two worldviews that are clashing. We have the, the physical world of view of the, the Samaritan woman who's like, well, you can't draw from this well. You've got nothing in your hand. It's pretty deep. And, and you know, why are you coming here to the Jacob's well? I mean, we're the ones who are supposed to be worshiping here. And then you have Jesus who's thinking what? Spiritually, every opportunity is a spiritual opportunity to bring someone to Jesus. And so they're really clashing over this idea of what is going on here. And so the living water will change your worldview. It has changed my worldview drastically. Now, it didn't happen like right after I became Christian. It didn't happen right after. Okay? It took a while. <laughs> okay? I still was seeking physical things over time. But slowly, as the Holy Spirit convicts you, you will start changing your worldview as in, okay, is this God? Is this what God wants? Is this what will help others before myself? Or the worldview of, I'm going to put myself last and everybody else first. And here is the physical idea of this woman looking for physical water. But Jesus is teaching about living water. So it's going to come to a point where it's going to smack her in the face and she's going to realize. Watch this. So the living water will fill us up eternally. It's not just something that we drink and we're like, oh, we need more. Look at John chapter 4, 13 through 16. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. So he's, he's talking about the physical water. You know, we always have to have water. I'm a water hog. Actually, it's a good opportunity to say, I need some water. If you want to drink your water, it's fine. After the operation, I can't, like, chug my water. I used to, like, chug the whole thing. How would be filled up? But I can't do that now. But anyway... Uh, but whoever drinks the water I give them never thirst. So he, he transitions from physical water to something that is spiritual. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, that, that picture. So you're going to have enough water that it's going to spill over to eternity. So you start your Christian life, you start your heavenly house, where? Here. You are already with Jesus, if you're a Christian. And so that water is going to bubble up, and guess what you're going to do? You're going to share it with others. It's going to bubble up, and you're going to have that eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me... <laughs> Again, here we go. She's thinking what? Physical. See, we need to transition people from the physical to the spiritual mentality. And how to do that is build a relationship. You don't go in there and start throwing the Bible or pointing the finger or judging them or hating what they're doing. You transition them by talking to them and having a relationship and loving them despite what they do to you. So here he says, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw the water. As a preacher, I'll be like, oh, this is a little frustrating. Okay? But Jesus, 
He has patience. He's good. He's wonderful. He's amazing. I need to have more patience like him. He told her, go. And so he wasn't getting anywhere with the whole physical water, living water. So guess where he turned to? He turned back to the physical to bring her in more. Here we go. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. So this water is eternal. This water, when you get Jesus, you have eternal bread. That means you're not going to hunger for other things. You know, when we hunger for sin, we're like, ooh, we need more, we need more, we need more, we need more. And then it turns into, you know, this huge sin, and everybody's like, they just woke up one day and started doing that. No, it started over here, a little bit of sin, and you started by choice to get to this point. Nobody wakes up one day and says, I'm going to murder you, okay? But it starts over here with hate. And then you don't deal with the hate, and then you have jealousy, and then you have, you know, plotting their death, and then you murder them, okay? You don't wake up one day and say, I'm going to go take money out of the bank the wrong way. Usually over here, you get, you know, you want money, you would have lust after money, and you, don't, you can't get it, so it turns into this. Same thing here. When we have eternal water, we won't need anything else anymore. It fills us up. We don't have to long after sin or things over and over again or things that don't fill us up that will disappoint us. We actually can be filled up and stay filled spiritually in the bread and the living water. But here, he transitions from physical to spiritual, trying to spiritual, and then he transitions back to physical about her husband. This is the reason why it's surprising that he's talking to her. Let's go to the fourth point here. The living water brings the spirit and the truth. So he knows the truth about this woman. Okay? He knows. But he's doing this question thing. I love the esoterical idea of uh, Socrates. Socrates always, he's one of the philosophers in the old time. But Socrates loved to ask what? Questions all the time. That's the best way to learn it. Ask a question, and then they have to respond, or they respond to the question, and then you get to the truth. Well, here's Jesus doing the spirit and the truth. Not just the truth, but the spirit. Look at John 4, 17 through 24. <laughs> now, Jesus knew this. Okay? He knew everything. But why would he want her to admit this? Interesting. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said it quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Oh, he's turning her to say, well, he knows more than I think. He has the Spirit of God, and he must be a prophet. Now she's recognizing a spiritual gift. He's turning her. Look at this. Our ancestors worship on this mountain. She's talking about worship now. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. I love this. Uh, Jesus didn't like to say, well, you're condemned. Well, you're not getting that. <coughs> well, you're worthless. You've had five husbands and now the one you're with. Woo! Yeah, you're out. What did he say? This is very interesting what Jesus says here. I think we should learn more about Jesus. But anyway. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. He never even acknowledges what she's been doing wrong. He goes directly and says this, you Samaritans worship that you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Obviously, because Jesus is a Jew at this time. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. He didn't say physical traditions and some of the truth, whatever you interpreted it with. Or he didn't say, well, get rid of the spirit and just think whatever truth you want. Or he didn't say, well, we have the spirit, but there's no absolute truth. What did he say? You must worship in spirit, Holy Spirit, spiritual matters, and in truth. And there's absolute truth. And the absolute truth never changes, no matter what culture, no matter where you're at, no matter what situation. This is absolute truth. 
There's nothing that can change it. Now, we can try, but in Revelation it says if you add anything or take anything away, guess what's going to happen? You're going to have more plagues and you're not going to make it to heaven. So you better keep this holy and righteous, the word of God. So he's transitioning her from the physical idea of having a husband, the physical idea of this water going from the well, this physical idea of worshiping in a place, to saying, we're going to worship spiritually. When I'm at school, guess what I'm doing? Worshiping. When I'm in the shower, guess what I'm doing? Worshiping. When I'm, you know, working on the house, what am I doing? Worshiping. Worship is not on Sunday morning. Not only on Sunday morning. We do come to worship. But everything you do, everything you say, everything you see, and everything that your actions are supposed to be worship. That's why I said the worldview should be worshiping God. And everything that you see, do, hear, say, you should have the maturity of going from here to here. If you stay here, you're immature. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to hell. I mean, going to heaven. You can still be an immature Christian and still make it to heaven. But wouldn't it be better to be mature and to mature yourself out of that? To not stay in the bottle and the baby diapers and say a baby Christian? Wouldn't it be better to watch what you say? And, and filter what you watch and filter what you what you uh, gossip about. Well, actually, shouldn't be gossiping at all. Or watch what your tongue is saying, if it's a lie or a truth. He is transitioning us from this physical idea to a spirit and truth. You can't have one without the other. You can't have truth without the spirit. You can't have the spirit without the truth. The truth has to hook to the spiritual world. If it's not, there's no foundation. Then we're just going on, whatever we have opinion, there's no truth, that whatever your truth is, go with it. Okay? There's fact, opinion, and truth. Fact can change sometimes, because scientific studies can change a fact. Opinion can change, but truth never changes. If we don't acknowledge that, then we can't have the spirit, because truth is absolute. Truth comes from Jesus, and Jesus is spirit. So we have to have spirit and truth. And then he goes here. It's, it, oh, it's so interesting how he does this. He talks about her mistakes, but then transitions to worship, and that he's a prophet, and then he just, I love it. And I don't think he's like slamming on the pulpit or like jumping up and down, but he just has this subtle way of saying, aha, you've acknowledged. Now I'm going to tell you the truth. John 4, 25 through 26, the living water is Jesus. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ this just gives me chills. It's coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then watch what he says. This uh, just makes me happy. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am you. Can you just feel the woman's like spine tingling? Like, I'm in the presence of God. I mean, I don't, it doesn't say in scripture what she she does, but I'm sure. I mean, it does say after what she does, but I mean, I, it doesn't say if she fell to her knees crying. It doesn't say that she hugged Jesus and, and just like embraced him. But I would be like, wow, he's standing in front of me. I actually need to go to uh, John chapter 4 and read the rest of the story. I'm not going to tell the rest of the story. See what, you see what she does. It's awesome. The, the quick response she has when she is faced with the spiritual worldview. It is awesome. Actually, I'll just tell you. She goes and gets the whole town to come see Jesus. I mean, it's awesome. She's like, well, if you're Jesus, I'm going to invite my neighbors, my friends, the people who don't like me, the people who do like me, they're coming to you. Wouldn't that be cool? Even not even a Christian, and people are like, go to that, go, go to that church. That, that's where Jesus' word is being preached. That's where the truth is. I might not go, but you need to go. <laughs> Look at Revelation chapter 7, 16 through 17. And Jesus just fills this up. Listen to this. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of the water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. We are in a spiritual kingdom. People need Jesus. 
They need the bread of life, and they need the living water. And to transition them from physical ideas to a spiritual worldview is hard. It's work. Because not everybody thinks spiritual. But we need to do it. You need to do it. It's your job as a Christian to bring other people to Christ. Yes, it's my job too, but I'm telling you, it's your job to bring them to the table and bring them to Jesus and have the bread of life and the water on the table for them to understand it. And how will you do that? You need to read. You need to love Jesus more than yourself. You need to love Jesus more than your desires. You need to love Jesus more than life itself. He says you need to hate yourself even more and bring Jesus in the center, and then he'll give it all back. Even to the point of hating and sacrificing your desires for Jesus. And then bringing love, peace, patience, and kindness and goodness back into your life. Jesus loves us despite our brokenness. And he wants us to come to God who is holy and righteous. But he needs to fill us up. You can't fill it up with porn, you can't fill it up with desires, you can't fill it up with family, you can't fill it up with yourself, you can't fill it up with money. The only one that can fill spiritually your life is Jesus. He is the living water. The living water will give you opportunity to have that world view and to fill us up in the spirit and the truth and acknowledge that Jesus is the reason. For the season, anyway, sorry. Jesus is the reason for all life. Come to the table. This is your opportunity. If you haven't encountered Jesus, come talk to me. Come up front. Have change your life. Jesus will change, trust me, in a loving, kindful manner. But it takes work. It takes faith. It takes your whole life. And then if you mess up, you come repent. He's not going to kick you out for just what we think is going to be a kick out of heaven thing. Jesus loves you, and God wants you. And the Holy Spirit can come change your world. So if you want to come today, come. If you want to come after, come. If you want to have questions, we'll sit down and talk about it. Jesus is the way, and the truth, and the life. And no one comes to heaven or God without Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you so much um, for the living water. Thank you so much for the bread of life. And it all points to Jesus. If we don't have Jesus in our life, it's just very hard to live with a spiritual outlook. It's hard to have hope. We can have hope in physical things. We can have hope in the world around us or money. But those things will go away. Those things will disappoint. But if we have hope in Jesus, we'll never disappoint. God, I pray that we will come to the living water and drink, that we may be filled forever in the idea of eternity, the idea of spiritual life. God, thank you for the living water, the bread of life, which is Jesus. Help us to realize that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So this time, an offering. Um, offering? Oh, sorry. That's okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Ooh, 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 I get to look it up in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Does anybody know what that is? The love chapter. The love chapter. Why do we say it like that? Have you ever know? It's not that kind of love, so I don't know why we say it. The love chapter. Anyway, a little buried right there. Um, so, 1 Corinthians 13, 6 and 7. Check this out. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. That's what should be the definition of a church. We give away. We don't care what that person has done. Now, we're going to be responsible for the money, you know, but we always trust. Well, here's a gift card to the supermarket. Go get some food. Or here's some cans of food. Or here's this community organization that will help you with food and we'll take them. We always hope. We always hope for the best. When we give money away from the church, when we give food, or when we give help, we always hope that they come to Jesus. Always perseveres. This church has been around, what, 148 now this, this year? Something like that. And what's their main purpose? To love people. And how do we do that? 
that you worship God through your giving. And then we give back. We show the love. If we don't show the love, if we just say, well, I love you, go hungry. I love you, go naked. I love you, go to jail. And what, what good are we? If we don't show our love, and that's what I love about this, this the budget and the money that we have here at church, it goes to other people. I love that. You know how many churches just keep it? It's like, oh, we can build bigger and better and everything. But we give it away. Because why? Because we love people. And if we love Jesus, we're going to give. And an offering is a good opportunity to do that, to worship God through the things that you give. Communion is a, a time where we encounter Jesus and that we say that we love him for, for dying for us and resurrecting. And so this, for sin shall not be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. When we come to Jesus, when we have this time of communion, we, we don't think, well, what's the 686 laws that we should be doing in the Old Testament, right? What do we think about? That Jesus loves us and has fulfilled the laws of the Old Testament. That he fulfilled our payment for sin under grace and love and mercy as Jesus died on the cross. And so we come to communion to acknowledge his body and his blood, and that's what the bread and juice resemble. It's a picture of a spiritual thing. So that's why we take this every Sunday, to recognize that Jesus is the beginning of the week, the beginning of our life, the central location that we always need to be in our world. That's why we take it. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your love and mercy. Thank you for your grace that you went to the cross and uh, gave us so much love um, that uh, it brings us to love you more and to bring to love other people more and to uh, love God. We thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.
a stand. Um, there's been two times in my life where I, I was the one that about. Um, hopefully you're not at that point in life, but if you are, Jesus can give you hope. Um, and um, it's amazing how he can turn things around so quickly and so wonderfully um, that you don't have to feel like that. But um, if you're at that point or if, you're, if you want to know about more about Jesus, come and we'll talk. Um, he is the Savior of the world. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you that we could be together and that we can encourage and equip each other to, uh, for your service. I pray that you would just uh, convict us, help us to change um, the things that we think, the things that we say, and the, the actions um, that it may be under your worldview, uh, the spiritual world. We just love you and thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have a great week. Okay. I love you, Dean. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I can come on. I'll give you one three days. We'll see what we can do. Cool. Thank you.